to get up earlier. You got to wake. I mean, right? Yeah, yeah. You definitely have to be on. You know, you have to be on your game. You know, they say that you know the, the top ten percent of NCOs in the army are, are chosen for that specific job, and they expect you to act like it. So, wow. You know, it, it, you definitely need to step up your game because you're you're working around people who are at a, a next level of professionalism that sure. I don't think uh, you know you you encountered yet at that point. You know, so you know you're you might think that you're the top ten percent, but you know you're walking into a group of people who are all who are all the top ten percent. Yeah, so, right. right. You, know, you might be you might be on the bottom of that pile, bud, unless you uh, unless you put in some work. But yes, um, being a drill sergeant was on par. It, there's two jobs that were my favorite. Um, while I was in the Army, uh, first one being uh, drill sergeant, the next one being platoon sergeant, which happened a little later. But both of those jobs, I felt like I was exactly where I needed to be, hmm. doing what I needed to be doing. And, you know, having that feeling of, just having that feeling like, you know, it, it, it changes your mindset, you know, and it yeah. changes. And yes, there's a lot of yelling that goes on. You sure. know, my, my job as a drill sergeant is to provide the chaos it's like uh, yeah. creative yeah. hazing. Yes, you know. I mean, and, and the nothing more that we're, nothing that we're doing is going is, is you know intentionally to be harmful. Yeah, you know. Right. But what I'm trying to do is provide a level of stress that you have never before experienced, yep. so that when you experience it again, you know that you can handle it. Right. Right. You know, and that's my job to provide to provide you, the trainee, with some chaos. Yeah. Right. And, and I think I was pretty good at it. Most dr- drill sergeants are like it's just a <laughs> certain type of person that they get for those jobs and yeah. they nail it. Did you ever feel any okay. inadequacy? Like, did you ever feel like you weren't qualified for the job? Was there like a. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. Like, everybody I worked with was way smarter than me, you know, in better shape than me. Mm-hmm. Like, it was total imposter syndrome. Like, I got to fake it till I make it because these people are like top tier people. And again, like I, I think I had beaten a little bit of that inadequacy feeling that, that we talked about earlier, but you know, that hangs with you for the rest of your life. There's a lot of, there's a lot of times where I just feel like, okay, you know, I'm in this room. I don't deserve to be in this room. So, you know, I got to prove that I deserve to be in this room. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense, but oh, it does. yeah, it totally does. I definitely, I definitely felt that way, and it was definitely um, a motivator. Well, cause to go back to the to the drill sergeant yeah, thing, uh, just one thing I wanted to say real quick is that the best part about that job is not the yelling, creating chaos. You know, that stuff's fun. You know, mm-hmm. but the best part is I'm seeing people grow. I'm seeing people gain confidence. I'm seeing people. You know, and, and I'm the facilitator for that happening yeah, for their personal growth. That, that would like, be to me that. That was the most incredible thing to be a part of. How am I that you know this fuck up? <laughs> How am I like inspiring change in these other people? Mm-hmm. And did you that know, I, did that help you with coming off of a deployment to have something else to think about? Because you're on on clock pretty much all day every day when you're a drill yeah, sergeant, seven day a week. Yeah. Yeah, it's a seven day a week job for, you know, two to three years. And so yeah, it, it definitely distracted me from it definitely distracted me from some of the feelings that I had from my deployment, mm-hmm. some of the post traumatic stress that I was experiencing. I yeah. couldn't focus on that because I had to focus on this other task that was ahead of me. Right. You know, so I think it kind of delayed my my healing. Um, but it was also very good for me in the fact that you know, I could focus my energy and my anxiety and my, I, I could focus that in a positive direction and positively impact others. Cause these kids, you know, at that point in time, they call them kids, they're all adults, you know, these men and women knew as soon as they get out of 10 weeks of basic training and whatever, uh, AIT or MLS qualification school they were going to, they were going into theater. They were going to Iraq. They were going to Afghanistan. And I had the benefit of several years of training. Mm-hmm. Leading up to my deployment, they don't they don't get that. Yeah, like, I think it's three to six months in the pipeline, and they're standing on the ground, you know, on the front line of freedom. Yeah, it might you be know, a so, different so, type of soldier nowadays. Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely 
there's ebbs and flows. It definitely evolves. So um, you're a drill sergeant, and you seem like you really loved that job. And so what? But what was going on with your home life? Like, was being away from your wife really hard and really taxing? What was going on with that? So as far as home life goes, yes. You know, I, I had gotten married a couple of months before I deployed to Iraq. So I'm gone for a year straight out the gate. You know, yeah. um, it, it's hard to have a relationship over Skype. Skype wasn't even really a thing back then. So it was like uh, Yahoo Messenger. <laughs> it's a basic form of communication back and forth. So it had definitely impacted, you know, my, my marriage at the time. And then, you know, coming home, I don't think fully dealing with all the stuff that I went through in Iraq. And there's, you know, there's her side too. The, the, the families go through things when you're gone that you're not mm-hmm. able to be there to fully support them. Sure. You know, so there, there's definitely two sides to that story. And then throwing myself into my work, which, you know, I couldn't avoid. Yeah. You um, basically had, had no choice. Yeah. I was oblivious. I thought things were going well. I thought I was managing everything. Um, like with your marriage you know, stuff. and stuff. With my with my marriage and my family life, I okay. thought I, I thought I was being as balanced as I could be, you know. But I think now, in retrospect, that maybe she had different ideas. Um. So that ended in a divorce. Yeah. So I did two years as a, a regular drill sergeant, and then I uh, went up and taught at the drill sergeant school for um, about eight months. So, um, like teaching other drill sergeants. Yeah, teaching new okay. drill sergeants how to be drill sergeants. Um, so now you're, in, now the you're in the one percent <laughs> instead of the ten percent. Now he's in the one percent. I'm a little fish in a very little pond with huge fucking fish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. No, it was, it was a good experience. I really enjoy teaching, and so I was able to teach uh, rifle marksmanship to people who had, you know, they had already been through basic training. These people had. You know, ten years of experience, that combat experience, and right. But, I was able but to you had to teach and, teach them so they knew how to teach the recruits. Yes, yeah, because okay. there's a big difference between I know how to do this thing mm-hmm. and being able to translate it to a group yeah, of sixty absolutely. people with no experience. You know, so we kind of focused on that. You know, how to how to up their game individually, but also you know, hey, this is how you do it on a large scale. Mm-hmm. So that that was that was really. It was really interesting. I really enjoyed my time doing that. But you know, once I got done with that, I uh, I got the worst orders. I, uh, I'm sorry for any of your listeners that live in El Paso, but <laughs> I, was, I got sent to El Paso, and I was not happy about it. <laughs> <laughs> so my uh, ex-wife at the time was um, a semester away from graduating from college in South Carolina. Uh, we decided that I was going to move to Texas. She was going to stay in South Carolina and finish up her degree. And then the night after Christmas, so the night of the 26th of December, I left South Carolina and, you know, left my life there and moved out to Texas. And, and that's when things really started to fall apart for me. You know, I, I thought I had it all together. I thought I had life figured out. And then, you know, I realized that later that, you know, I'm not so smart. I, I can't predict the future. It's uh, crazy how when you're all wrapped up in something, you can think that your other life, your home life is going perfectly good and, and um, yeah. come to come to find out it's a shit show. Yeah. You know, so I, I, I want to avoid, you know, dis- discouraging anybody, but, you know, the, the situation with me and my ex-wife didn't work out, you know, for multiple reasons. I think anybody who's been divorced can kind of understand the complexity of that. You know, but at that point in time, you know, I, I spent about a year alone in South Carolina, in a, or I'm sorry, in like Texas, in a empty three bedroom house. You know, just me and my dog and my job, as everything else in my life just seemed to crumble around me. Um, I, I feel like so, that would be a really um, just depressing way to live with um i'm sure you just like to be working and outside of your house and not having to be in that situation yeah because when you're you know when you're isolated like that there's only a couple of things you can do yeah you know, and and one of them is sit there and ruminate over all this stuff that's going on and just sink deeper and deeper into your own 
relationship and which, depression. Which evolves right. sometimes into suicide or whatever. Yeah, it can. And I almost became a victim of that, you know. And, uh, I, I almost became one of those numbers. You know, I, I I didn't receive a promotion that I thought I deserved. My my uh, marriage completely fell apart. You know, I, I wasn't, I hadn't really dealt with all my demons, you know, so those started creeping in now, you know, they found, they, they, they found the door cracked and they right. started pushing through. And, um, yeah, so I, I started drinking a lot. If I wasn't at work, I was drunk and, uh, just and, to yeah, deal so with like life being life home evolved rapidly. Yeah. 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 Just to deal with being home and try to escape, yeah. you know, again, you know, with, uh, the alcohol and the drugs is just trying to escape feeling these bad feelings. Like I don't want to feel this way. And so one night, um, you know, after a, a bottle of whiskey and a bad phone call, <laughs> I sat in my garage, uh, with my gun and my dog and, you know, I almost ended my life that night. I was very lucky that someone reached out to me um, on that day. I don't know if somebody I hadn't heard from in a long time. You know, just one of my friends just calling to check in and see how I was doing. They, they had no idea do, that I was Do they now? Uh, yes. Yes, I told them. Okay. You know, but yeah, they had no idea the point that I was in my life. And that phone call, I think, saved me from, from killing myself which is hard to say, you know, like yeah. there's so much great things that have happened since that point in my life. Like my life has completely turned around 180 degrees and like I couldn't be happier. And I would have missed all that because, you know, I'm, I'm trying to create a permanent solution to a temporary problem, you know? So yeah. Um, and having, well, you know, that's where, you know, just reaching out to your friends, you know, is, is huge. It's important. You don't, mm -hmm. You know, like on Facebook, everybody puts on their happy face and yeah. shows you what they wish their life was like. But you never really know about them. You never really get a peek behind the curtain, you know, unless you're actually reaching out to people and talking to them like, oh, shit. You know, they might be showing one thing, but that's, that's just a mask. Everything else is falling apart. And so I'm eternally, I'm eternally grateful that, you know, I mean, I, mean, I would have hurt so many people by, by doing that. I would have hurt yeah, so many people. Well, and that's the thing to think about because when you take your own life it it affects so many other people you know and yeah and in that moment you can't think about anything but yourself you know so anybody who's out there that is going through shit you know everybody's going through shit but anybody who you know is even if even if that tickles in the back of your mind reach out to a friend talk to somebody I know it's I know it's embarrassing to, to lay your soul there and, and tell people that hey I got problems I yeah. got big problems mm -hmm. I don't know how to deal with I'm getting overwhelmed but please reach out to somebody before you do more damage to yourself yeah you know, absolutely the people who really care about you and good message like right sometimes just having a place to tell your story even um, that's kind of my idea with this podcast right. is to get people to a point to be able to tell their own stories and, mm -hmm. and for kind of a therapeutic um, relief. Yeah. Telling your story is so cathartic. You oh, know? Yeah. Yeah. The first time I told somebody that like, yeah, I was this close to killing myself. Like I had the gun in my hand. Like I was ready. I yeah. was there. Wow. And it wasn't just being able to have a community you know, or tell somebody or just, that catharsis is indescribable how much that helps. You know, you can't hold them in, you know, like, like we were talking about. You, know, you can't just be, you know, I'm this tough guy and I just I just hold everything in and I just eat it. I, I push it down into that box. Like, mm -hmm. it's so damaging to you, it's so damaging to the people around you. Like, go talk to a therapist, talk yeah. to a friend, talk to, talk to God. Ta talk talk to, to someone, uh, even talk if to it... Your, even if it's so like just things, journaling, if you yeah. feel more like comfortable. I would talk to my dog. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. As crazy as that sounds, like I would talk to my dog, like my dog Gus, like he, he helps me through it, man. You know, yeah. like he's a German shepherd and he's a big, dopey idiot. But <laughs> at that point in my life, like he was my best friend. He was my best friend. Like yeah. he, 
he was my reason to keep going. Like, yep. well, he's hey. going to feed God. You so, know, like, 